I welcome you to uh, this particular message tonight, uh, which would be Good Friday. Uh, I'm going to finish the series of messages I have been doing with regarding regarding the bucket list, having to do with the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. This last one is uh, significant. Uh, it's found in Luke's gospel in the 23rd chapter. So if you want to go ahead and set your Bible, it's Luke chapter 23. And we're going to look at verses uh, 44 through 46. Now, Luke is the only gospel writer that records the very last words that Jesus would speak. And I, I find that interesting. Uh, and, and it sounds like it should be the case. See, Luke was a, a doctor. And Luke was very much interested in details with regard to a person's life and uh, even with regard to a person's death. Uh, he wrote a, one of the Gospels, which uh, tells us a, a great deal about Jesus' life. But he also takes the time to record things significant about his death. And this one detail did not escape his attention. So he shares the last words of Jesus with us. Uh, and what he shares with us uh, and, and what Jesus speaks uh, is, is very uh, essential. It's very important that we not leave this off our own personal bucket list. And, and by the way, we, we're all, we all have one, whether we've written it down or, or not. We have one in our, our minds. And all. there are things that we want to do, things we want to see, things we want to experience before uh, we uh, die, before we leave this world. But there are things, my friends, that we ought to do. There are things that we ought to see. And there are things that we ought to experience. No matter whatever else is on our bucket list, these things must not be omitted from our bucket list. And uh, we've talked about six of those things. Like I said, that Jesus has already given us. And now we look at the seventh one. Jesus is dying. And that's not a surprise. That's what he came to do eventually, to die on the cross for our sins. The difference is his death is voluntary. You know, he is, he is dying because that's what he came to do so that we might be able to live through him. No one could take his life from him. He laid it down of his own accord. And as he said, if he so desired, he could take it back. But that was never his intention. Uh, his intention was to die for us, for the sins of the world. Now, the one difference about the way in which Jesus dies uh, and uh, as over against the way others die is that when Jesus dies, death does not get the last word. Jesus has the last word for death. And uh, that's significant. So look at the story with me. And you'll appreciate this even the more realizing that. That this is not an end in the sense that it's over and Jesus has lost control. That he has failed. It's over in the sense that he was always in control. And he succeeded. He won a great victory. It was now about noon. And darkness came over the whole land until... It was three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. You know why? Because the curtain represented a separation, a separation of the people from God. When the curtain was torn in two, and it was torn, by the way, from the top to the bottom. When it was torn in two, it was like God taking it in his hands and just ripping it. It meant that everything, everything, my friends, that, had, that separates from God had been taken care of through Jesus Christ. There was nothing to keep you and me from coming directly to him, from having fellowship with him and being at one with him because of what Jesus had done on the cross. All of this now having been accomplished, Jesus said before, you know, it is finished. And then he said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. You know, he voluntarily died. And also that because everything was completed, and all because everything that needed to be done was done, and all that his purpose had been fulfilled in every way. But I want you to think about those words with me today. Uh, Into your hands I commit my spirit. You know, I don't think this was by any means the first time Jesus ever said this. I, I think his whole life had always been committed to God's hands, his father's hands. 
allowing him to, to, to hold him and to use him and to guide him in the way that he wanted. But I think it's important for us to understand the significance of it as it speaks to our lives. And all because the only way you and I are going to be able to live well uh, or and ultimately die well is to be in the hands of God. And all to be in his hands and to be in his hands means we have to have a bright heart. And also Jesus statement tells us how to get our hearts right with God, what it means to have our hearts right with him and how to live our lives in the hands of God. So that when the time comes, we know we can commit our spirit to his hands as well, because it is something that has become natural for us. So let us pray and then we'll get into this. Father, I ask you to help me at this time to be able to fully understand the words that are spoken by Jesus here and, and to convey that understanding to your people who wait to hear a message from you today. And I pray that you will uh, help us to discern the significance of these words, not only as Jesus spoke them on behalf of himself, but I think as he leaves for us an example of what we also can do at, when our hearts are right with you. Tell us how to get this accomplished. And I'll tell this, Father, uh, tell us this in such a way that uh, we can uh, allow ourselves to be in your hands, both now and forever. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. To be in the hands of God means that we need to be connected to the Father's heart. And that's the first thing. If you're taking notes, I want you to jot that down. It means to be connected to the Father's heart. Remember, uh, this, uh, what Jesus says are not, not idle words. These are, these are specific words, and every one of them carry a great meaning. In fact, in this particular statement, every word in this last statement is significant. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Uh, this is a quote, by the way, from the Psalms. It comes from the 31st chapter, and it's the fifth verse. It was a, a prayer that was prayed by, by King David. By the way, this prayer uh, was not only prayed by him, but it became a common prayer for many of the Jews over time. They would pray it as well. And it became a prayer also that inspired in the 18th century uh, a, another prayer, a children's prayer to be written. Uh, you're probably familiar with this, whether you've thought about it or not. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to take. How about that? Probably never knew it was inspired by Psalm 31, but it, it was. Uh, and it's a, a very meaningful prayer. Uh, but when Jesus prayed it, he prayed it differently. Uh, uh, that is, he prayed it as no one prayed it before, because he began this prayer and all with the word Father, the word Father. And uh, that's a significant thing. Uh, have, knowing God as Father is, is an intimate thing. It's a, it's a personal thing. It makes things more meaningful. Just knowing there's a God, and uh, generally, and uh, is, it doesn't make that that doesn't make him personal necessarily, or or, in, or make us intimate with him. And uh, but that's what we should be. In fact, there's four ways God would like for you to know Him. If you, uh, He'd like for everyone to know Him. First of all, as creator, uh, secondly, as king, thirdly, as judge, and fourthly, as father. But one of the relationships, these four relationships, that is fundamental to all the other three. You see, you can know him as creator, but that's still not enough. You can know him as king and realize he is the one who rules, but that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily change your life. You can even know him as judge, but that doesn't necessarily make your heart right with him. But if you know him as father, then all these other things become more meaningful as well for your life. He wants you to know him in this way. So ask yourself a question, is God my father? And before you answer this question, let me explain. It. And all, you aren't ready to die, uh, or excuse me, you're not ready to live until you are ready to die. But you're not ready to die until you're ready to meet God. And all, you're not ready to meet God, though, until you know him as your father. But you will not know him as your father until you become his child. And, but you do not become his child until you are born again into his family. 
And you cannot be born again into his family until you receive his son. Simply put, God becomes your father when you become his child. But you can only become his child when you receive his son. Say it one more time. And I'll, you, know, you aren't ready to live until you're ready to die. And, I'll, and you are not ready to die until you're ready to meet God. And you're not ready to meet God until you know him as your father. But you cannot know him as your father until you become his child. And God and all becomes your father when you become his child. And the only way you can do that is when you receive his son. This is the way you connect your heart with God's heart because Jesus was it God was came from God's heart when he came to you and me. For God so loved the world, he gave us his heart, he gave us his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So for you and me to be able to, to know we have committed ourselves to God's hands it is to know that we have been connected to the Father's heart. But there's a second thing that I want to impress upon you. And that it also means to be committed to the Father's hands. To be committed to the Father's hands. Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit. And I want you to think about that word, commit, for a few moments with me. It's a Greek word which means to place beside. Uh, it's actually, it's a, it's a banking term. It, it means to, to make a deposit, to deposit something. Uh, uh, it could be money or anything of great value. It, it would be like us taking something of that sort and placing it in the safest place that we can imagine in terms of a bank. That would perhaps be in our safe deposit box. That's where we would put it. But I, and that's what we're talking about here when we talk about commitment. It's putting it, my friends, uh, in the safest place it can be put. But also this idea of commitment is something that is done voluntarily. You know, it's something that you do without being forced to do it. See, Jesus was voluntarily depositing his spirit into and his life into God's hands. That's something he did from the very beginning, so it made it easy for him to do it now at the very end as well. Why is that special? Because think about this. The no Old Testament sacrifice and all was ever uh, sacrificed voluntarily. Well now it was by the person who, who brought the sheep, if you will, or whatever. But the sheep didn't do so voluntarily. <laughs> it didn't. It didn't crawl up on the altar and lay down and and say, "Cut my throat," you know, and 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 uh, let me bleed out and die. And uh, it had to be laid up on that altar and held while its throat was being being cut. But Jesus, he does so voluntarily when he's committing himself. And uh, it's not something he's been forced to do. Not something that he is that, that because his will has been taken from him. He did it fully. Trusting God, uh, he placed his hands, his spirit rather, into God's hands. And uh, you and I uh, have to find it within us to do the very same thing, to place ourselves voluntarily in the hands of God. As much as he loves us, he's not going to force us to give our lives to him. He's not going to force us to, to forsake whatever in order to take hold of him completely. That's something we have to be able to come to terms with ourselves and be willing to do on our own. You say, well, preacher, I'd like to be able to do that, but it sounds hard. You know, how do I, how do I know I can, I, can, I can go forward with this kind of thing? And uh, it's something that I, I wrestle with. Let me tell you, when you're in God's hands, you are at no better place than you can be in, in, in this whole world. There's no place you can be that is safer, no place that is more secure, no place that is more satisfying than to be in the hands of God. Let me give you a few scripture, by the way, that scriptures speak about the hands of God and how significant those hands are in terms of what they mean for us. Being in God's hands and all can, are, are, are good for us for these reasons. Isaiah, if you want to write this down, I'll give you a moment. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, it tells us there that God's hands are saving hands. In John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29, it tells us that God's hands are, are keeping hands, that once we are in his hands, no one can take us from his hands. 
In Isaiah, again, in chapter 41, in verses 10 through 13, it tells us that God's hands are helping hands. And uh, in Psalms, in chapter 89, in verse 13, it tells us that God's hands are strong hands. And I like what it says in the book of Acts, in the 11th chapter, in the 21st verse. It, it tells us that God's hands are, are, are hands uh, that give us ability. It opens doors that otherwise would remain closed. And the Bible tells us when God opens a door, no one is going to close that door. But if God should shut a door, no one is going to open it. God is in control. And, and here he opens doors for his people to go forth and be his witnesses. And uh, it's obvious that God is in their lives or these doors wouldn't open and these opportunities wouldn't arise. And uh, God's hands also are the safest and surest place to be, Psalm 31 and verse 15. And also you and I, and all to, to, to be able to commit ourselves to his, uh, to his hands, it's, it's being committed in, all, in every way uh, of our lives, knowing that the surest place that we can be, the safest place, the most satisfying place is to find our lives in his hands while we're living and certainly even when it comes to the time that we die. So to be connected to the Father's heart is to be committed to the Father's hands, which brings me to the third and final point of the message that I wanna share with you this day, this day. And that is, it means to be confident in the Father's hope, to be confident in the Father's hope. And uh, I, I want you to listen to uh, verse, uh, uh, 46 here. Uh, I want to read that to you again. It says, Father, Jesus called out with a loud voice. You know what it means? It doesn't mean it was it was an agony. This was a this was a shout of victory. This was a, a, an ex exclamation of, of victory. When he crawls out in a loud voice, nobody missed this. He wanted everyone there to hear this. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. And uh, it, Jesus wasn't going out into darkness. He wasn't going out into nothingness. He wasn't going out at that time. He, he was willing to let go of that last breath because he knew that that wasn't the end. And uh, he knew that that wasn't, the, that wasn't the final thing for his life. And uh, the, we have a hope. And, uh, and it's the hope that the Father gives us. But when we, when we place ourselves in his hands, it comes as a result of this. And I'll see what Jesus deposited that day. And let me tell you about this hope. What Jesus deposited that day and uh, with his heavenly father was not his body. And uh, that body was going to remain on the cross uh, for a little while longer. It would uh, be punctured by one of the Roman soldiers' spears. It would ultimately be taken down from the cross and be wrapped in cloth with spices and maybe placed uh, in a tomb. What Jesus was committing to his father, and this is what we must, must not miss, was the most valuable part, not only of himself, but of all of us, the part of us that is eternal. And all the part of us that, that goes on, the part that separates us from, from uh, animals and, and, and from plants, it's our spirit. And you see, I believe too many people are so hung up on the things of this world, the things they see and they touch, uh, things that they cannot keep, that they cannot hold onto, and all that they're missing out on the most valuable part of themselves and not doing with it what needs to be done with it, not committing it to God and putting it in their hands. Your body's going to die, but your spirit is going to go somewhere forever. God doesn't want you living just a so-so life, you know, no matter how decorative you can make that, no, no matter what you can put into it. What does it matter if you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul? Now, God wants us to have a hope-so life, a no-so life, a life that, that goes beyond just simple understanding of the world in which you live, but realizes there's much more than just that which I can see and that which I can feel and touch. And uh, it's that which I can begin to know and sense through through my spirit. And uh, this is the this is our hope, not just what can be accumulated uh, and, and can become a part of us for the moment or for a few years, but what what we have that can be not be taken from us, even in death, that, that comes and remains a part of us forever and ever. 
Peter speaks of this oh, uh, when he writes uh, in his first letter. It's 1 Peter chapter 1. And in verses 3 and 4, he says this. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. You know, most people have a dying hope because it's going nowhere beyond this world. But we have a living hope. Why is it a living hope? It's a living hope through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And, into, and, and, and it takes into account an inheritance that can never spoil or fade because it's being kept in heaven. For you. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a wonderful thought? You know, one of my favorite uh, authors, and, I, and I've got a lot of, of favorite authors in terms of books I have read over the years, but one of them is Philip Yancey. And in one of his books, he wrote something that I, uh, that I underscored. And, and I want to share those words, uh, his words to you from that particular book at, at this time. And uh, they're so beautiful. And he says this, and I quote, for everyone, Death involves a process of letting go and uh, uh, letting go of attachments, relatives, friendships, possessions, identity, everything that, finds, that defines life for us, we let go in death. But then he says, for the Christian, death also involves an anticipation of new beginnings. We let go of bodies that have served us not perfectly, but well enough in exchange for new bodies. We let go of a known life touched with grace and with pleasure, but also with evil and with pain. But it's an exchange for the promise of a life perfected. We let go of the muddle of doctrine and wavering faith in exchange for sure knowledge at last. So during the lifetime, because we are in his hands and we live the rest of our lives in his hands, we are preparing ourselves for that exchange, end quote. I like how Paul says it in his letter to the Philippians in the first chapter and in the sixth verse, he says, being confident, this is our hope our, and it's our confidence. He says is this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on. To completion. We have confidence in our Father's hope. Confidence, not just that our spirit is being deposited in his hands, but that those same hands are taking that spirit and one day placing it into a resurrected body that will love him and will live with him forever and ever. You can't be ready, though, for this. You're never ready to live until you are ready to die. And you are never ready to die until you do it and until you put yourself in God's hands. Make sure that's on your bucket list, that you have placed your life, your spirit in God's hands. It'll enable you to live better. It will enable you to die well. It'll give you a peace that nothing else in this world can even come close to, to, to uh, giving you. It has not the ability to, not the means to, but God can because he is God. And also, my friends, be connected to his heart. Make sure your heart is at one with his. Be committed to the Father's hands. Be sure that you are trusting him in everything and in every way allowing him to live in you and through you as he desires. Be confident and then be get, become confident in God's hope. God's hope, it's a living hope because it's eternal. It's eternal. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for these precious words of Jesus and what they convey to each one of us as they become our words. And you know, as, as we realize again, you know, that by putting ourselves in your hands, we have placed ourselves, Father, where you know, we are at best, where we are our best, and you know, where we can become uh, so much more than we could have ever realized otherwise. 
We, when we place our stuff in your hands, while everything else around us that is known of this world, and all, it comes to an end, that remains a reality. And uh, because it is in your hands and we are in your hands. Let it be, Father, as you so desire, and we'll give you the praise and the glory through Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.